Today we have some really exciting demos. Uh, about five things have to go perfectly right. The internet working is one. It's currently working with a full room of people, so that's great. Uh, so today we're going to demo some really neat Livebook in the Cloud features. Uh, Chris and I have been working on this uh, for the last couple months, and it's really unlocking kind of next level workflows uh, in Livebook. So if you're not familiar with Livebook, you'll get to see some neat demos with this, but I think people familiar with Livebook have used it for like tinkering, they've used it for learning tools. Uh, some people are using it for business intelligence and business analytics, but we're really taking it to the next level to allow you to accomplish like really interesting GPU and cluster workflows. And we say in seconds, and, and we'll get into that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how all this was enabled uh, with Flame and how we're able to use some of these neat features and put them back into libraries like Explorer. And Chris will really show off some of these kind of GPU um, in the wild work, uh, workflows. But I need to do a little bit of review, review. So I've talked about Flame in the past. And Flame is really what enables some of these workflows. But Flame was talked about, uh, I think, four months ago. It looks like on EU. So I'm going to briefly review uh, this acronym. The acronym is doing a lot of heavy lifting, so forgive me here. Uh, but it, it, Flame is what gives us elastic scale in Elixir. And it's an acronym that we wanted to do a lot. So it stands for Fleeting Lambda Application for Modular Execution. And what we really wanted to convey here is we're able to take your code, scale it elastically, but we kind of want to co-opt this idea of a Lambda. Because you have like AWS Lambda, Cloudflare Workers, you have all these silly proprietary services that allow you to run code elastically if you just buy into like 12 layers of proprietary services that call proprietary services. So we want to take this idea of like, no, what if you could just use your application like a Lambda where you could run it kind of in a uh, ephemeral manner and then modularly call into it and kind of ditch these series of uh, proprietary services. And what that looks like in your code is something like you have this naive code in Elixir and you want to, let's say, generate some thumbnails, something that's like heavily CPU bound with FFmpeg. You write these four lines of code, it works great. You persist the keys that you stored to S3 in the database, but then you go and run this in production, and now you're CPU bound in the web request, or you're CPU bound in the live view serving your UIs. So like, you don't want to do this, and this is why we start paying these services lots of money. But what Flame lets us do is just treat Elastic Scale like a task async. So it lets you say, like, you know what, when I want concurrency in Elixir, I want to use all my CPU cores. I just use task async put my code in a function that was right there, and now it's running con concurrently. Flame is the same ease in, in mindset, where you, now you're just like, do I want this to run elastically? Take that code, put it in a Flame call, and now it's running concurrently just on another server somewhere uh, in, a, in a fleeting way. So it's going to come up and do the work, run your code there. Just like you had run it um, in line here, it's going to return the result to the caller. You can do database inserts there. You can do pub sub because it's running your whole application. right? The whole idea of A in Flame is application. So I can start up a light ecto pool and do a repo insert in this function just like before because it's my whole app. It's not like some Lambda that's calling you know, some light Docker image that then I have to put into SQS, and then I have to write the SQS consumer and do all this stuff. No, I just do the code in line. And not only that, we have all the Beam at our fingertips here. So it's not like just this like nerfed Elixir runtime where if like, you, know, you can show the golden path, but the moment you want to do something that's like complex, you have to like go off the beaten path. No, it's like it's, it's just your app running distributed uh, Elixir. So if you need to get a file from the parent to the child, like in the FFmpeg example, you, you, know, you may need to actually have a file to, to run this on. You just write two lines of code, and now we're streaming the file from the parent node uh, to the child node because I.O. in Elixir uh, in Erlang is, is distributed out of the box. It's process-based, so if it's process-based, it's just going to work because uh, message sending is going to work uh, across the cluster. So in two lines of code, I can use the features of Beam to get a file from the parent to the child. And we'll see this later as an example of one of our demos. But the whole idea here is it's your whole app running. And since we do everything in Elixir and processes, that you almost never have to change your code. And it, it still surprises me. So there'll be times where like, I'll write my code that is doing like some supervisor start child. I have some process running in my application. And now I want to put it in a flame. And you're like, oh, shoot, what am I going to have to change? And like, nothing has to change, because the fact that that process was local and we moved it to a remote node, it still works, because I'm communicating with it with like a gen server call. Like, all these primitives that exist in Erlang just work, because that's exactly how the concurrency model works. So this is how Flame works. And we'll get in, again, this is all review. But we, we want to provision a new instance for you. So anytime we encounter a Flame call, you have this block of code. We need it to run somewhere that's not local. So we're going to provision a new machine somewhere. That could be on the Fly API. There's a Kubernetes adapter as well. So wherever you can run 
Kubernetes, which is pretty much anywhere you can run Flame. So a new server is going to be booped into existence and say, hey, I'm here. It's probably going to be some beefy instance. It's going to connect back to the parent over distributed Erlang. The parent says, hey, I'm glad to see you. And it sends the function over across distributed Erlang to be run. And this is going to close over any state and have that state get serialized for you without you having to think about it. So like the video struct in this example that is referenced in this anonymous function just gets sent along because that's how Erlang works. Like the code node spawn monitor with a function reference just does that for me. Like someone could have made Flame 10 years ago and all the pieces were there. Like this is just built in. Like you, I didn't have to serialize anything. You're just like node spawn monitor, here's a function. Oh, please serialize all the terms in, in the VM for me and it will do that. And then to get the result back to the caller, the caller is going to block meanwhile. Uh, since Elixir is a concurrent language, it's no problem. So we just send the result back to the caller as if they had run it locally. They get the result of the repo insert. And then the runner can idle down. It can wait, await new work. But we can treat it the same way we would treat a, lam a lambda, which is going to be pay for only what you use, idle down if there is no work. And we just call system stop. So standard library features enable this kind of thing. So this has been out for, I'm going to say, six months or so. But this takes us to Livebook, where we want this uh, elastic scale in our Elixir apps, and we've been able to do that. But the problem is when we want to take this idea and apply it to these uh, code and data workflows in Livebook. So we had to teach Flame how to do this. Because the problem with Livebook is the code is highly dynamic. So the way Flame works and the reason it works is you can take a Docker image or a code deployed on a parent. You can boot up a child node with a matching code on the other side, and that's how you can send code across because the code exists on both sides and then it matches exactly. So when we got to Livebook, it's like, well, the code is constantly changing, right? I could start a server, and even if I could get the code to that server, I'm constantly adding dependencies, I'm changing modules. Like this code is a dynamic environment that's always changing on the parent. So how do you, how do you synchronize these things, right? Well, you synchronize these things. So what we added to Flame was a way to synchronize code between a parent and child. So it's something you opt into. Uh, so I, I, can Im I can imagine really interesting use cases outside of Livebook. So uh, I'm not going to talk about those. But if you're interested, uh, we can talk about them after the, after the talk. But CodeSync is a general mechanism. So Flame isn't aware of Livebook, but Livebook is aware of Flame. And these CodeSync options just synchronize code between the parent and child. So you add a CodeSync option. You say, copy all my code paths for me. And then we can synchronize Beam files, which is your compiled Elixir modules, as they change on disk. And the way that works then in the flow of Livebook is we provision a new runner, like you've seen with Flame before. And then the really interesting thing is we start this baby Elixir node on the started uh, instance. So this is like an Elixir node that isn't, a, isn't aware of the world. So it's actually an Elixir script that gets started up. Uh, Livebook boots its Docker image up. And then instead of calling the Livebook release, which is going to run your whole Livebook, it actually sees this Flame environment variable. And it's going to run an Elixir script called start flame, which is 30 lines of code. And this Elixir script is no dependencies. It's just starting the script in Elixir, right? And that's my, my bullet point. There we go. And that thing is going to bootstrap itself. So uh, a mix install was added to enable uh, runtime dependencies in Livebook. So we're able to use the Elixir standard library here to say start an Elixir script. It has no dependencies. And then it mix installs flame on itself with a matching version that we put in an environment variable on the node that starts up. So then suddenly, it's flame aware. And then when it's flame aware, it needs to connect back to its parent. And how does it do that? Because we just ran Elixir, an Elixir script. Well, Erlang Standard Library lets you start an Elixir node in a non-distributed way. And then that kernel start can then turn that Elixir node into a distributed Elixir node. So these library, standard library functions just exist in Erlang, right? So you, you can just start this baby Elixir node. Make it aware of flame. Now that it's aware of flame, turn it into a distributed Elixir node with net kernel start, and then you call node connect, and now you're connected to the parent. And again, this is like 30 lines of code with Elixir formatting. So now we have this baby Elixir node that is self-aware. It's bootstrapped itself. So the only thing is getting the code on that flame runner that matches the parent. So the only other steps of this is to copy code over there. Interesting. So OK, this is cool. So this screen down here is real time, and then my laptop was delayed by five seconds. So that's why I didn't see the, the bullet point. Cool, computers, OK. Um, OK, so yeah, so we're going to take the code on the parent, and we're actually going to tar up that code. So how do you do that? Well, Erlang has an Erl tar library, right? So these standard libraries uh, functions just exist. We take all the code paths when the node starts up. We package them up. 
How do we get them to the other node? Well, we saw earlier, how do you get files from the other node? You use distributed Erlang. You can just enum stream, or sorry, enum into across the stream, and Erlang will send that across the cluster. So ultimately, when you're working with streams and file IO and, and Elixir and Erlang, it's just message sending. So essentially, it's, we're opening a tar, we're using a message send, we get it on the other side, and we just call Earl tar extract. So we've just copied code over to the other node. It's aware of all the Livebook runtime code, but since this is a highly dynamic environment, that code can be constantly changing. So what do we do? We diff that code. So we love diffing in, in Phoenix and LiveView and Flame as well, so we can't get away from it. So instead of having to copy the code constantly, we're actually going to watch for the beam file changes on disk once this server is started, and then we'll just diff that over. And we do that in the same way. We open up a tar, package it, send it across, extract it, so we're doing minimal diffs of code changes synchronized to a started server. So you can kind of think that we're like hot patching the flame that started up constantly as the code is changing on the parent. And then that's all we need to enable these kind of workflows, uh, except there's one minor caveat. So for all the things that I have been doing, this works perfectly. But if you're doing machine learning and some uh, really interesting workflows, you have this problem of working with uh, large like data frames. And these things uh, exist, and they point to a place in memory with an X that's doing uh, a bunch of uh, interesting computation. Uh, so this is what Jose came in and solved, is the ability to do essentially distributed garbage collection. Uh, so imagine you start up some distributed workflow in Flame, and this is going to start uh, work with a data frame that loads a bunch of information, and you want to work with that data frame on the parent node that started the flame. Uh, that works, but then that parent node actually wants to hold a reference to this data frame that exists in the remote node. And that remote node doesn't know that some other node has a reference to this data frame, and it could garbage collect it out from underneath the parent. So there's a flame trackable protocol now that when you're using, let's say, Explorer or these other libraries in practice that implement this, you don't have to think about this. But what we've done is essentially created a uh, distributed garbage cl collection for you. So you get this data frame on the parent, it implements uh, this flame trackable protocol, and then you can work with it, and it's not going to be garbage collected until you release uh, a, a hold on that, and then that will notify the remote flame node that, OK, this thing can be garbage collected now, and it will clean it up. So uh, pretty incredible work, and this is stuff that you don't have to think about. But if you imagine, like, OK, flame is now giving you elastic compute that you can just send arbitrary code across. It's serializing your code for you. You don't have to think about it. We're bootstrapping these baby Elixir nodes. We're hot swapping code. We're diffing the code. We have remote distributed garbage collection. Like, how many dependencies did this take to implement in Flame, right? Well, none, right? This is a standard library. So Flame is, has an optional dependency on uh, JSON, J-A-S-O-N. Um, but on OTP27, it includes uh, a JSON encoder. So Flame on OTP27 has literally zero hard dependencies. We're just using features that exist in the standard library, which like, is ridiculous. I just want people to understand like everything we just showed is a tiny amount of code, all implemented with this Elixir standard library and Erlang standard library. So let's see it in action. And this is where the internet needs to work. We'll see if it does. So I'm going to give you a Hello World example first of, of Livebook, and then we'll see some like, real actual workflow that you can do in an application. So I'm going to create a new notebook here. And one of the new Livebook features is actually running a runtime, which is your Elixir um, execution and co compilation environment, on a different server. So this is my Livebook desktop I have installed locally. So this Livebook is running locally. And I'm going to say, you know what? I actually want to run the, a node that on a, within my infrastructure that is going to be my Livebook runtime. So there's a fly runtime that exists. A Kubernetes runtime is being worked on. So this essentially just lets you poke into your infrastructure and run your Livebook runtime somewhere else within your infrastructure. And we'll see why that's important in a moment. So I can configure, like, do I want a GPU on this thing? How much memory? doesn't matter. So I'm, it's going to create this machine from scratch, started that node. OK, so now we just provision a new Elixir node on fly. It's running Livebook there locally. So I'm running an Elixir node locally, which is my Livebook. It's connected to, in my infrastructure, a new Livebook runtime. So if I do like uh, system get in, let's see uh, what would exist, like fly private IP. So this is all being proxied up to my infrastructure. Yeah, so this isn't my IP. This is the, the runtime that exists out there. And this is important because now I have access to my full infrastructure. So I can call into my database services. I can call into HTTP services that exist. It's almost like I VPN'd in, but without tail scale, 
without WireGuard running. We're just using Livebook to poke a hole in proxy into our infrastructure, and then we have all of our uh, infrastructure there to call into. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. But we really want to show off is uh, you know some some fly stuff. So, or sorry, some flame stuff. So I'm going to define a module here like hello, and it can just you know say world. So we'll say hello world, and it just returns world. And this isn't very exciting, but if I start this up in a flame, you can see how the, the code synchronization works. So let's create a smart cell, and I'm going to create a flame runner. So Elixir, or sorry, Livebook has a smart cell that will actually bootstrap flame for you. It added a new dependency of flame and Kino flame. Livebook's going to do, add those new dependencies for me automatically. We're going to wait for them to be compiled. That's happening up in this block here. OK, so we have this smart cell, right, where I can configure my flame node. I can say how many nodes I want to start up. I can say how much memory they should have, where they should have GPUs. But I'm going to modify this. So I'm going to convert it to a code cell. And we can see this is just a flame pool with the code sync option that we saw before. So I want to modify this and have it say uh, verbose true so we can actually see what's going on. So I'm going to hit that. So since this is min zero, nothing was started up for me, but it did pre-build my uh, code paths here. So now all we want to do is be able to execute some code inside that cell. So if I say like hello.world here, this is all running locally. Well, it's running locally in the Livebook runtime, which is running remotely. <laughs> and this works, right? Nothing, nothing uh, interesting. But now I can do a flame call here. And we have no server running. But we can see how this is going to provision some infrastructure for us. So we'll say runner. Uh, put that code inside this function, and now we can see in real time this is going to start a server from scratch. It's going to boot Livebook. It's going to do that Elixir flame start bootstrapping process. It's going to copy all the code there, and we'll be able to see that working. So in about five seconds or so, we should have this node up and running from scratch, and it should then copy the code, and it should then execute that module. There we go. We got some verbose logging. There's the world that executed on an ephemeral server that's now up and running. And we can see that we had a bunch of uh, verbose output where it's extracting all these tar files, which is all, all your Elixir and mix installs, all your dependencies. So that's just pretty cool. But imagine we then go back and change this code. So we have this runner. It's up and, and hot. But we want to go ahead and, and change our implementation to say, like, Elixir conf or something. Hello, Elixir conf. We'll leave the typo in there. Oh, but we'll fix it. OK. So we go back here, and we run that flame call again. So we didn't even experience that delay, but that went and it patched the runner that was hot, because it was still running. And it diffed the code. And we can see the only thing we sent over was the beam file for hello beam. And then we extracted it, and then it executed that code. And now it's updated. So this is giving you hot code patching, code synchronization in Livebook. This is running on this ephemeral server. And it just works. So you just modify your Livebook however you want, and your flame's going to be constantly getting the new code. And just to prove that this is running on new infrastructure and what this can do for you, I want to show off another smart cell, which I only learned about uh, recently, is it's a remote execution cell. And what this lets you do is connect to any other Elixir node that exists, as long as you know the cookie, which is like the password, and run some code on another Elixir node. So since I'm running on the Fly runtime, I've poked into my infrastructure, any application that's deployed on this Fly organization is accessible on the network. So what I can do is just connect to that thing and run code there on some existing app deployed applications. So I have RTT, which is a 30-node uh, Elixir cluster here that gives you like ping times across the world. So it's actually 34 or 33 Elixir nodes that are running in this application. So what I want to do is connect to this node that exists on my private network on Fly. Uh, the cookie I've previously saved in my Livebook Hub, so you don't have to see it, even though you wouldn't be able to access it. But we can save these, these secrets in there. I'm going to assign the result of this cell to a variable. And then within this Livebook cell now, let's try node.list. And let's see what happens. OK, so this is, these are my 33 nodes that exist on that cluster. This Livebook cell right here is running the code in the context of this RTT node, which is super cool. But it's more than that, right? So imagine I want to call some service that exists on, uh, on this node, some code that exists there. So I think there's like a node monitor uh, is the name of the module that gives you the ping information that ultimately we saw on that UI. So if I say RTT, is that, what is it like? Yeah, node monitor. So notice we're getting, we're getting tab complete for, we're getting IntelliSense tab complete for the code that exists on this RTT app that's not defined in this Livebook. It's just an Elixir release deployed on 33 nodes in Fly. So Livebook is actually going into this node and giving you IntelliSense for all of the code that exists on the RTT app. So I can say node monitor pings, I get tab complete. 
And now I'm executing code. There we go. So I get a bunch of information about the, the ping loss ratio and the, the round trip time for code that exists in my infrastructure on a deployed application. So again, not only can you call your databases that are deployed in your infrastructure, whether it's Fly, AWS, you can call HTTP services that are accessible on the VPN. You can call Elixir code that exists on other nodes deployed in the cluster. All within this one lightbook running on my local laptop. So this is neat. That was the hello world of, of Flame and Livebook. But now let's see something more interesting until we get to see Chris's uh, super interesting examples. So I'm not doing any GPU workloads here, but I have put together a demo doing something um, more realistic or useful in an application. So my original Fly demo had uh, it was a thumbnail generator that allowed you to upload a video. And that video, while it was being uploaded, was generating thumbnails on the fly. So while the video was still being sent by the client, you were getting the thumbnails that were being generated on the UI as it's being uploaded without putting anything on disk or putting anything on S3. So I took that example of this thumbnail generator, which pops a shell to FMMPEG, and I put it in Livebook. And the goal here was to do something where you could take a real workflow, which is like video processing, and be able to run it at scale. So I wrote a Livebook that I could point at an S3 bucket. And this bucket could have terabytes, thousands of videos. And imagine I want to process, generate thumbnails for those things, uh, process that video. Well, how do I do that more than one video at a time, right? So I wrote it in a na naive way initially. I have this thumbnail generator. We're not going to go through all the code. It just opens up a FFmpeg shell. So it wraps this port that's running, driving FFmpeg. It sends results to the caller as these thumbnails fall out. And then the other interesting thing is I'm going to have these thumbnails pass to a large language model to give me a visual description of the, the thumbnails. So I'm using uh, Llama 3 uh, Lava for that, which is just a, on my Fly network. So I poked into Fly. I can call these Flycast addresses that don't need authentication because they're only running on my VPN. And then at the end, I generate uh, a summary for the video. So I'm doing thumbnail generation, and I'm also generating uh, summaries and titles about the videos in, in this example. Uh, so what I did was I had this code written. And I wanted to go run it, so I pulled in Rec, which is the best Elixir library that exists. Uh, Rec is life. If you haven't used Rec, I'm a Rec evangelist, so um, come talk to me after this talk about Rec. Uh, but who needs an S3 library? Because Rec in three lines of code will allow you to fetch and stream S3 objects. So Rec S3 attach is just going to set up your uh, configuration for you, and then I can just do a list or do a uh, get to that bucket, and then list all the bucket results. So I get all of the keys in that bucket. And if I wanted to process every MP4 that exists in this bucket, I could just filter on that and then run this block of code. So that's what I wrote initially without Flame in this live book. So we can just kill this Flame call here. And I have uh, some code running that is doing a rec git. So I'm streaming every key from the bucket in chunks. And then in each of those chunks that I'm streaming, I then pass to FFmpeg, which is up and running. So nothing touches disk here as we get chunks coming over from S3 passing into FFmpeg. And then as we're still streaming that video, we're receiving the thumbnails that are falling out of the video, much like the Livebook UI that was getting the thumbnails. And then as we get a set of three thumbnails, I call into a large language model to generate a description of what's happening in the video. And then all along, this, I'm, I'm actually updating the Livebook UI. So Kino is a library to do visual uh, cells and update the UI library in, in Livebook. So as, I'm, as these things are happening, I'm using Kino append to say, like, add the description to the UI, add the thumbnails to the UI, so you're actually seeing what's happening. And then at the end, I generate a description for the video. And the cool thing about all this is, and the way Flame works, is like, OK, well, this works for one video, but if, what if I have thousands of videos, right? So you go into your block of code that's doing the expensive thing, and you wrap it in Flame call. So we're going to put a Flame call around this. And now this block of code is going to be running somewhere else for us in an ephemeral way on a BP server. And then I, when I wrote this, I was like, well, shoot, I'm going to have to, like, I'm going to, have to change the code. Like, I, I lied a little bit. Like, you barely have to change your code. Because I, I was like, Livebook uses Kino, and I'm having this Kino frame thing. But then within this block of code now that's running on another node, I'm doing like a Kino append, right? I'm doing a distributed UI update back to my Livebook here. And like, there's no way that's going to work, right? And a spoiler, it just works. So, <laughs> so I blew my own mind with this. Like, of course it works. But since this is message-based and the I.O. is being forwarded, like, the, this just works. So, so you're literally doing a ephemeral node that's running this compute. You're doing a distributed UI update back to my local Livebook desktop that's running 
and no code had to change. So let's see this work. So I'm going to do one video at a time before it goes and tries to do everything. So I have a, a leaf blower video here. And this is a video of my son um, driving a like electric uh, John Deere cart with uh, we bungee strapped a leaf blower onto it, and, and so he could leaf blow the driveway without me having to do it. Um, and we'll see what it does. So it's going to take about 40 seconds to start because uh, it's going to take like three to five seconds to start the Elixir node, but then I have to get FVMPEG on there, which is like 500 megabytes. Then I'm I'm just doing an apt get right now. So that just unpacking uh, takes a bit of time. And then it has to actually start streaming that, that blower video. So we should see this, what are we at, 35 seconds. And then we should see every three videos uh, that get generated, yeah, it starts updating the UI. So this happened on another server. It did a Kino update. That Kino update just sent it back to the Livebook runtime that was running on Fly and from the Livebook runtime back to my local Livebook desktop. All of that just works. So we can see he's driving this, this gator here with a leaf blower, and then we're using an LLM for every three thumbnails. So the sequence of still shows a young child riding a toy tractor, progressively getting, progressively getting older. OK, these things are crazy. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Technically true, he is progressively getting older. You're right. You know, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> As a parent, you, you see them getting older in real time. It's real. Wow, this is deep. Um, so OK, so it, it identifies a leaf blower here. And with another three stills, it shows a young child sitting on a toy tractor with a leaf blower attachment, appears to be playing or operating equipment, possibly pretending to help clear the leaves. Yes, but it actually worked extremely well. So we'll see that in a moment. <laughs> Let's keep going. So like, look at this. It worked, it worked like beautifully. <laughs> and then at some point, I'm like, yes, like it worked. Give it a big thumbs up here. And then it detects like an adult giving a thumbs up from behind. So like these large language models are actually like off the shelf. They're free. They're incredibly impressive. Like it's even able to know that like someone behind the camera is giving a thumbs up. So okay, this worked really well, like shockingly well, patent, pen, patent pending. And then it generated at the end a summary of all the individual still summaries. So the title was Little Helper Growing Up with Leaf Blower. Summary, a heartwarming video capturing a young child growing up and enjoying imaginative play with a toy tractor and leaf blower attachment. The child seemed progressing from simply riding the tractor and using it as a prop for pretend yard clearance, illustrating creative growth over time. Like, pretty good, right? So yeah, so this works incredibly well, like shockingly well from off-the-shelf software. Like, you know, Livebook is free, Flame free. These uh, Llama 3.1 free, Mistral that I'm using for the summary, all free software. So you can do actually like real work here. But the goal here is like, OK, we can do this for one video, but what if we had thousands, terabytes of videos on an S3 bucket somewhere? So we can come in here and, and just say, give me all MP4s. And my live book flame pool is up to 20 servers here. So I think I have a bucket of like 15 or 16 videos. Uh, so we're going to see all of them work now. And this is like the beauty of this workflow, right? So now I went from something that was a cool demo that I, could, I would then have to take, extract out of live book and deploy on my infrastructure to just doing a real workflow here, right? I could be doing data mining, data extraction, data processing, and as we'll see uh, with Chris, actually machine learning, right? Working with big data. And now I'm gonna do this across, this could be thousands of videos, right? Up to whatever concurrency limits that I wanna set for the number of servers running. So I have just like a bunch of home videos here. Uh, this is actually gonna be uh, some uh, couple Blender royalty-free videos I could find. Uh, so we caught a runner hot here, um, and the rest are gonna be spinning up to accommodate this demand. So we can see like, the sequence of still shows a character in a snowy, icy environment at dusk or dawn. Like, it's incredibly good. So it generated that summary already. It knew it was Sintel, which is from the file name. So the only thing it knows about the videos is just whatever file name. It uses that to try to infer uh, whatever it can about the video. And the rest is just, it's pulling from the stills. There's a video of more gator uh, driving. Let's see what else we have. Some, some of a puppy. Oh, uh, there's one of my son going down a slide, which is um, pretty good because in, it, it often will talk about a dog in the video, and I thought it was like hallucinating. Uh, the Livebook frame is going to be jumping around, but like it kept mentioning this dog occasionally, and I was like, "There's no dog here, right?" Like these large language models, they hallucinate, but there actually is a dog, and like two, like I, see, there's a dog right, right here behind this slide. Anyway, like these things, even like, <laughs> it's shockingly good, like a little bit concerning. Where I'm like, "Oh, there is a dog there." Um, we'll see if it if it generates a description here. But this one is, this one's usually pretty good, but sometimes it takes a darker turn where it's like, it will start mentioning the algae blooms as being like a health concern. And then, 
when my son goes in the water, he's rescued by someone waiting in the water. Um, so like most of the time it's really upbeat, but occasionally like, you know, these things take a darker turn. But let, let's see. It's encouraging right now. So it says the people are engaged in water activities near a dock. They appear to be either preparing or participating in water sports. Yeah, it mentions wakeboarding and water skiing, which isn't true, but this raft that my wife is on does like look, it's odd. It like either looks like scuba gear or some like wakeboarding thing. So I'll give it a pass there. So it's still working. Yeah, let's see a, a final summary and then we'll, then we'll call it. Yeah, so there's like a, a snake video here, obviously an easy one for it to pick out. The tower that falls over here, let's see what else it's working on. Let's see if my, my nodes have actually spun up here or not. So in a, in a future live book update, which Chris will show, like it will actually show you the, the running nodes here, but I won't, there's actually 16 nodes running that we would see once this live book cell completes. But if I go to my fly shell, I can actually see the amount of servers that are running. Looks like fly is the app for this live book runtime. So I actually have 17 machines running, which is the hello world example, plus the live book runtime, plus the 15 flame machine pools. So yeah, so this is running, I could be running 100 servers, I could be running however many I wanted to concurrently process this work. You could be persistent to your database at the end of this, right? I could be throwing these uh, thumbnails back onto S3, and this would just work. I wouldn't have to try to authenticate because I'm running and poked a hole into my infrastructure. So again, we can now take Livebook from this experimental runtime learning tool, business uh, intelligence tool to something where you can actually do serious business uh, and something that you couldn't do anywhere else. So one thing I wanna stress before I hand it over so, to some really uh, cool GPU examples is that Livebook has features that other companies have been funded millions of dollars for for just one individual feature. So like collaborative, Livebook's fully collaborative by the way, so multiple people could be in this notebook editing it. I would see it like Google Docs where like they have cursors. Like there are companies that have been given millions of dollars just to add collabor collaboration to Python notebooks. There are companies that have been given millions of dollars to add GPU elastic workloads to Python notebooks and like we just have it, right? Like we're demonstrating like multiple companies worth of features here that's just available uh, to everyone open source and free. So I want you to uh, let that sit with you while we see some of the next examples uh, from Chris. So Chris, I'll let you take it away. Hi. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris, uh, not just for showing all of that off and, and all that, but for making awesome tools that I get to use, because I get to do the fun part, right? Like, he's built this incredible stuff. You know, the, the Livebook team have built incredible stuff. The NX team have built incredible stuff. And I just get to be, you know, super excited to use it, which is fantastic. Um, you ever drive home, you know, when you were a kid and you saw, like, McDonald's or something like that, and you really wanted it, and you were like, Mom, can I have McDonald's? Um, I'm like, no, we have, we have food at home. And the food at home, you know. You guys know the meme, right? Like, so there's me, and I'm saying, can I have distributed code notebooks with ordered execution and arbitrary hardware runtimes and free scaling and interactive plots and experiment tracking? I'm very greedy, right? Um, but Python said to me, we have code notebooks at home. <laughs> and these are our code notebooks at home. Um, listen. Jupyter Notebooks are incredible. They're an incredible tool. They've been around for a long time. They have made millions of people more productive. I, I, yeah, there's, there's millions of us, right? There are tens of us. Um, but people doing uh, you know, that work, it's a little bit like a, a boiling frog. Um, if you want to achieve all those things that I said a minute ago, you've got to start pulling all these different tools. You know, Chris mentioned that there are companies that get millions of dollars to do collaboration, get millions of dollars to do things like experiment tracking, get millions of dollars to figure out ways of distributing your work. Um, and, you know, it, it ends up being really, really challenging. Um, you know, there's this, this XKCD comic uh, that's probably eight years old and it's very much still the same situation today. If you are working in Python and, and dealing with all of this stuff, you are managing all these different things. And when you work with GPUs, it's even more difficult because you have to start managing CUDA runtimes and CUDA NN and, and like all these different things. Um, and it becomes just 
so devastating. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little story about that. You know, there's not really a punchline to this story, but I just want to try to give you some context so that you can understand the, the challenges. You know, so let's go back 10 years, 10, 11 years, 2013, 2014-ish. Um, I'm you know, getting older and I can't remember my own history, but I was finishing my, my master's in environmental economics. And I was really excited about the things that I was working on. Um, I saw a job opportunity at uh, this you know, prestigious institute at LSE and some academics that I really wanted to go work with. And I went and applied for this research assistant job and I, I got it and I was so pumped. It was like it tied into the work that I was doing for my PhD. I was trying to understand how uh, climate policy affects the direction and the rate of innovation. So I was trying to take this you know, all of this patent data, and you know, there are 160 million patents in the world now. Um, there weren't quite that many then, but pretty close. Um, and they are often very long, right? They're academic article long. So we're talking about hundreds of gigs just for the US. You're talking like terabytes of data. And what I wanted to do was, you know, this is before the age of the LLM and before the age where we all kind of are familiar with, you know, you hear the term vector all the time now, right? And dense vectors, they're representations of documents in numerical formats. And I was trying to figure out a way of doing that. And I'm using these huge models. At that point, we didn't have the kind of like, uh, you know, uh, machine learning models that we had now, have now. I was using topic models and trying to use those to represent patents. Um, but yeah, I had, I had these big ideas and I was, I was really excited. Um, and then the work was always in code notebooks. I was using Jupyter notebooks. At that time, I think they were called IPython notebooks. Um, and I am using Spark. If you're not familiar with Spark, it's a way of doing distributed computing. It runs on the JVM. It's uh, kind of, it, at that time, it was the new hotness. It's a little older now, but it was the, a way of, of putting all your data in memory, distributing it across an arbitrary number of machines, and then running these kind of MapReduce workflows over it, but MapReduce over things in memory so it was faster than you know, the Hadoop workflows. Um, and uh, so I'm working with these, these things and I'm trying to run my code in notebooks and what you have to do is you have to actually go and go into the cloud and in your big Spark uh, you know, cluster, you have to install the notebook runtime. You have to like SSH with port forwarding so that you can access it. You gotta go in there and you do all this stuff and you're constantly spinning up and shutting down hardware. I got caught out more than once and blew portions of the research budget where I had spent, uh, sp spun up you know, 150 machines. Um, and then got distracted doing something, had a meeting, didn't spin them down. Um, it's, it's challenging. And when you're trying to communicate findings, you're trying to quickly iterate and understand things, you're trying to do your machine learning, your, your data science work, it's a ton of overhead and it's a ton of headache, right? And I think this is fairly typical. I think that a lot of data scientists, this is kind of like our, our, the burden that we, we bear and we often don't talk about it or we kind of just chalk it up as something that's, that's unavoidable, right? The stress, the anxiety that goes with the ops management that has to, to come with the data management, right? And the data, the data science workflows. I mean, unless you offload it, in which case, then you have to deal with, you've got an ops team, right? And you've got to kind of go through your ops team and say, oh, can you get me this? Can you get me that? Um, it's, it's just a big challenge. And what you're often doing is stringing together spaghetti code, like uh, shell scripts to try to load things up, make sure you've got the right dependencies, make sure you've got the right CUDA runtime, make sure you've got, you know, each thing that you need installed, and then you spin up your hardware and you forgot a thing or it doesn't work, and then you've got to spin it back down and you're taking you know, 20, 30 minutes at a time to get this stuff, right? So why do I think that it's common? Because as Chris said, you've got these companies. Let's fast forward 10 years. It's been 10 years since I was going through those struggles. I continued to go through those struggles. I built a career doing, you know, going through those struggles. 
And just a couple of weeks ago, maybe even just a week ago, you saw there's a, a YC-backed company on doing a launch Hacker News. Um, and it looks really, really great, right? Uh, this, is, this is their sales pitch. We let you run your local Jupyter notebooks on remote cloud GPUs. I wish I had that 10 years ago, <laughs> but it's taken 10 years to get here. And there are tons of companies that have fallen by the wayside along the way. They're trying to do this. You know, we're, we're in a, a world now where GPUs are super important, but it's, it's, it's all the same concept, right? Um, and we've, we've got, you know, th this is kind of their spiel. They say, you know, we built this because we learned from talking to data scientists and ML researchers um, that scaling up experiments is hard. Yes, it's, it's very hard. You know, most researchers like to start in a Jupyter notebook. Absolutely. Uh, they rapidly hit a wall when they need to scale up to more powerful compute resources. That's exactly right. And to do so, they have to spin up a remote machine and then also start a Jupyter server on it so they can access it from their laptop. All this stuff that I was just telling you that I was doing 10 years ago on Spark clusters, it's still the same thing today with, with GPUs. And when you're, you're doing experiments, you're trying to um, you know, train models, do things like that, what you'll often do is you'll use your local GPU, if you've got one, um, and then you want to go and run it on a big GPU when it's time to actually go and, uh, and train. And that big GPU, it's, it's not just got to have the correct runtime. It's not just got to have the, like, the code that you had with the same dependencies, um, all of that stuff. It's also got to be able to access you know, cloud resources. It's got to be able to access data sets. Um, and it's got to be able to then take the, the trained models and put them somewhere. There's, there's a whole field here called MLOps. Um, and it's, it's a really big deal. So what was the reaction to this company, right? Uh, again, just validating that I'm not alone. Cool, optimal UX, top comment on Hacker News. People are excited, they want that, right? Um, and then you see some of the worries come out as well, like how do you deal with the file system? Do, is it available to the, the remote kernel? Like how do you deal with transferring the Python environment? You can see that people are, they're, they're worried about this stuff because they've all been bitten. You know, you've got this, this guy saying, I, I love this concept. I, I SSH into my high performance computing cluster at, at uni all the time. And you know, we've got these shell scripts that I'm writing. People are talking about doing workflows with VS code. It's really, really challenging. And the question, you know, the, the thing that it boils down to is what matters when you're doing real world work. And I was saying before, there's trust. It's replicability, reliability, talking to your external stakeholders, trust in the work that you're doing and knowing that the, the models that you're running and the insights that you're getting are what you expect them to be. It's simplicity. And I mean that in the sense of like Rich Hickey's like simple made easy. What you want is to get all of the, the op stuff out of the way so that you can do your data science work. You're thinking about data science, right? You don't want to think about ops when you're trying to think about data science because you are doing, you're, you're answering questions, you're doing research, you're trying to figure things out. And you need speed. And I don't mean that in terms of like blazing performance in, you know, when it actually comes time to run and it actually comes time to do your, your, your BI workflow or your, your train your model or whatever, you know, that's all cool. But what I mean is this, the speed that allows things to be iterative. Because when you're doing data science, when you're doing real research, you're going back and forth. You're trying to ask questions and you're thinking of new questions and you're trying to run the, the same code over and over again and iterate and try to learn things from your data, right? And all of that, you know, it all adds up to the feeling of anxiety when you have to worry about all of the other stuff behind the scenes. When you have to worry about, is this identical? Is, you know, am I going to hit enter and then wait 20 minutes for a response when I'm trying to work through this, this idea and try to understand something for a deadline, for a stakeholder? Um, you know, if I run and train my model, is it going to be, am I, is it going to uh, work in the real world the way that I thought it would work when I was, was working in my notebook, right? And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about training models. Um, one of the things that you do when you train models is you try to experiment with different hyperparameters, okay? So the difference between parameters and hyperparameters is when you train a machine learning model, what you're doing is you're estimating parameters. Those are the, the tensors 
that then go along with the model and the, the architecture of the model to do your predictions later, right? But in order to get those, you use hyperparameters. Hyperparameters determine how well your model is able to estimate parameters, right? So when we're talking about hyperparameters, we're talking about things like learning rate, we're talking about things like batch size, and I'll explain a little bit about how that works and what those look like if you're not familiar with them in a moment. Um, but again, multi-million dollar companies, this is a screenshot from a, a service called Weights and Balances, which is, or Weights and Biases, sorry, which is a fantastic service, and it allows you to track your experiments. Because when you go to train, you're not just saying, all right, I'm just going to pick some things and I'm going to hit enter and we're going to wait for it to finish training. You need to run many experiments with many different combinations of the different hyperparameters that you have. And so we often call this hyperparameter optimization. There are some really wonderful tools, um, but you can think about it. We can think about it in a very simple sense. There's a concept called grid search, where you basically say, all right, I'm going to take these, this hyperparameter and this hyperparameter. I'm going to come up with a grid of different values for each of them. And I'm going to try just all the different combinations. And we're going to see which one works the best. And then we're going to use that to train our model and save those parameters and use that when we go to, to production and, and use, do inference and things like that. Right. So let's see how that works in practice. I have lost connection because my phone is tethering. Um, and we're just going to take a moment and get there. There we go. All right, we're OK. Let me make sure the other one is up and running. And we're going to switch this over onto the big machine here, or onto the big screen here. These displays. And I'm going to change this, and I'm going to change it to mirror. And we're going to go here, and we're going to make this big. And we're going to go over here, and we're going to have a look. So everyone can see, right? We're going to fine tune a classifier. OK, so I have uh, a data set. It's uh, from a, a company that's producing cannabinoid edibles. Um, and they are trying to find patents that are related to their technology, right? So they've marked, they've actually marked thousands of, of patents. And they said, you know, these ones are relevant, these ones aren't relevant. But now what I want to do is I want to be able to train a classifier to go and look at new patents or patents that we haven't looked for and search for ones that are relevant. So we need to infer across all of those. And we need a good classifier that can do that. OK? So what we're going to do is we're going to bring in Bumblebee. We're going to bring in you know, Axon. We're going to bring in Explorer. We're going to use the, the full kind of NX stack uh, in Elixir. But we're going to try to find the best possible model, right? We're just gonna we're gonna fine tune BERT. Uh, if you haven't heard of BERT, it's kind of like one of the the OG, uh, you know, kind of transformer models that people use. Pretty good. Um, and we're gonna set up a, a flame pool because we're going to run many experiments. We're gonna run many experiments at once. So the, the flame pool that we're going to run, it's, it's got you know, a minimum of zero. So we, don't, you know, we uh, have no uh, instances that are starting immediately. But we're going to say a maximum of 64. Okay? Um, I'm setting max concurrency of 1, because we want to make sure that we're distributing across all of them. Um, we're going to use L40s as the GPUs that we're using. We've set CPUs to 4. We set memory to 32 megs, one GPU per machine, OK? And we've passed some, some secrets across as well, because we're going to do some, some good stuff. So the cannabinoid uh, data set, you know, I, I went and pulled from our big Elasticsearch cluster, pulled down a bunch of, of patent data. We've got abstracts. Um, and we're going to, and we've got, you know, we've got those, those labeled. And we're going to take them, and we're going to uh, stream them from Explorer. We're going to actually use um, a pretty cool uh, addition to Explorer that uses the file system, uh, a, a file that actually goes and pulls directly from S3. 
Um, so we don't have to go to S3 and pull it. We can actually tell uh, Explorer, go and, go and get this uh, CSV from S3, and it will do it for us. Um, we'll set up some training data. And then we're going to use Bumblebee. So Bumblebee is going to load the spec. Um, we, we set the repo at the top. That was the BERT one that we, we saw up there. Um, we're going to say we want it for sequence classification, because we want to classify the, the text sequence, right? Everything is just a, a sequence of, uh, of tokens. Um, we're going to say that we've got two labels. Um, and then we're going to load in the model and the parameters, get the tokenizer, which is a tool that takes text and turns it into numerical tokens that can be passed to the, uh, to the machine learning model. And then we're going to add a layer to it, uh, which is a logits layer, uh, which is an output layer. It's, it's basically saying, um, give me a, 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 a probability for each of the different classes, right? And so we've got that. Um, and we've got our, our training loop, um, which is going to take that logits model. We're going to use axon, the loop, the trainer. And we're going to say that our loss is going to be categorical cross entropy. If you know what that means, great. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Um, and we're going to use a particular optimizer. But that optimizer is taking a parameter. It's taking learning rate as a parameter. Okay, And you can see um, we've got uh, this uh, metric. So we're going to pass some accuracy, uh, recall, precision. These are all kind of uh, the things that we, we care about when we're training a classifier. So um, you know, accuracy, accuracy tells you the, the, the percentage that you get right, basically. Um, you know, recall and precision are different ways of measuring true positive, false, false positives, those sort of things. We care about those. And what we're going to do then, I'll scroll all the way down here, is we're going to create our grid, right? So what our grid is going to look like is we've got a run identifier, we've got the batch size, and we've got a learning rate, OK? So um, hold on one moment. Yeah. Absolutely. How's that? More? How's that? No worries. And I'm going to get rid of this. Um, we're going to do two, one. E negative five. That's where we missed out there. Um, hold on one moment. Need to put that here. So we're going to do that again. The learning rates were too big. Um, hold on. Uh, what am I doing here? Point one dot zero. That's right. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. And then we get our grid again. So we've got these, these learning rates, and they're kind of in a reasonable, a reasonable range. Um, and as I said, run identifier, batch size, learning rate. And so you see we've, we've used a, a four comprehension and kind of put together these combinations. And we see that our grid is of length 64, matches up with what we had before. Um, and then I'm going to define some plots. And I'm going to use Kino for those plots. You see Kino Vega Light new. So we talked, uh, you know, Chris talked a little bit about um, Kino before and how it works, but what we end up with, I can show those in a grid, is we end up with, uh, I'm going to shrink just a tiny bit because I want these to fit on the screen. Oh, there we go. Um, so we're going to end up with these four different plots. One is for accuracy, one is for loss, one is for precision, one is for recall. And then we're going to take the grid, we're going to do a task async stream over that grid. Okay. Uh, we're going to take the learning rate, the run identifier, and the batch size. We're going to load our data set. The data set streams in chunks of the batch size that we've set. We've passed the learning rate to the, the training function. Um, and we are going to spin up some nodes. And we're going to see what happens here. So it takes a little bit because we have to cop copy over you know, NX and Bumblebee and all of that. We need to load the, the model. We need to uh, compile the model all that good stuff, um, you know, all the stuff that you would go and do with your, your ops team or by yourself. If you're spinning up all of these machines, you're going into EC2, maybe you've got some, some uh, EC2, uh, some, some like EC2, uh, you know, uh, templates or whatever. And what those machines are going to do is each of them is going to run this different element in our grid, and they're going to start 
uh, training a model. We've got, we're, what we're going to have is 64 GPU instances, GPU machines, rather, on fly, each of which is training a separate BERT fine-tuned model. And as they do that, in just a moment here, I'm just going to check, yeah. As they do that, we're going to start seeing the results or the, 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 uh, the live, um, uh, uh, the, the live kind of uh, information about each of those models. So we're going to see, as I said, accuracy, we're going to see loss, we're going to see precision, and we're going to see recall. And we're going to see them for each run. So you see the runs start to pop in, that's number one, okay? And you can start to see it. Now run number five has started to send information. Um, and each of these, running on a separate fly machine, running a GPU, is sending all of that information back to our live book and telling us how each one of them is running. And we're seeing that. All right. <laughs> we can see that live in real time. And you can see them over here. They're all connected. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to disconnect, and we're going to save some money. <laughs> now, all of those have shut down. So what do you do once you've trained the model? Oh, we've disconnected here, too. My, my phone connection is not great. So what do you do once you have trained that model, right? So we've run 64 different experiments at once. So the time that we would have taken to run one before, we can run 64, or an arbitrary number if we really want to. You can go up to however many, you know, however much capacity Fly has. Um, or, and, uh, or however much capacity you have in your Kubernetes cluster if you're running this on, uh, with a Kubernetes backend. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take another data set. So I mentioned before they want to, they want they have another, they have, they have, uh, they want to find the patents that are related to their technology, right? So we've gone and gotten a pool of potentially related patents, and it's a, a couple of million of them. And we've broken them up into parquet files that are uh, 50,000 patents each, and stuck them on, you know, Tigris, and which is S3 compatible data store. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to start a new pool. And this pool doesn't have GPUs. Each, each uh, machine on this pool has two CPUs. It's got eight, uh, eight gigs of memory. And you can scale this up you know, really big if you want to. Uh, I happen to know that uh, the, the number that I'm going to use here is like 28, I think. Um, so uh, we're going to spin up this, this uh, cluster. But you know, again, min zero, it's scaling in real time as we need it. We've got a maximum of 32 machines. And once we do that, then we can go to REC. You know, again, shout out, best, best Elixir package there is, uh, best Elixir library there is. And we're going to get that list of data frames. Okay, We're going to take those keys, which are the, the Parquet files. Um, I know that they start, you know, they're in this folder. They start with eval, and then they've got a number after them. And I'm going to do a flame call, and I'm going to do data frame from Parquet. Okay? And what we'll see over here, we've got some connected nodes. What we're going to see is those start to spin up, right? Now, I'm just assigning, I'm, I'm actually just calling data frames. I'm not even assigning it to anything, right? Like, I'm assigning it back to this data frames equals at the top, right? Which is running in my local live book, OK? Now, we're going to wait for those to all load up. You know, we were spinning up 32 separate machines. Each of them is going and getting the Parquet file, and each of them is loading it in. Now, if any of you have used Explorer before, you'll know that we can see what a data frame looks like, and it gives you some information uh, about the, you know, the back end is polars. We've got 50,000 uh, is the length. We've got three columns, abstract, title, and UCID, which is like a patent identifier here. Now, we've got something 
pretty cool, which is that that data frame, this one, the first in that list of data frames, is running on a different node. And I can then go, and I can get some information from it as if it was local. I can hit, I can just pass data frame, DF. That's the first one in the list of those data frames that I pass back. And I just filtered it as if it was a local data frame, and I got the results back in my local live book. Now, I can do that. I can go and I can take those 32 different machines that each are holding a huge amount of data, and I can iterate over them, and I can get information about my entire data set locally. So I'm going to say for, for data frame in data frames, I want to reduce. I'm going to reduce over. It's just regular Elixir, right? And I'm going to reduce over them. Each one of them, I'm going to, I'm going to count, right? So I'm going to mutate it. I'm going to say, does it mention the word cannabinoid in the abstract? If it does, then I'm going to give it, you know, I'm going to give it a true. If not, then false. I'm going to pull that column. I'm going to sum over that column to see how many are true. And then I'm just going to reduce and, and add. And I can see that of my whole data set, I've got 1,225. Um, and I could go and filter, and I can go and get them. I can go pull them down if I want to. And again, you can, what you can see is that, that we're immutable, right? So you can go back, and this hasn't, that, that original data frame, it hasn't changed. I'm, getting, I'm going and getting the information from 32 different machines. Now, last thing. I'm going to start another flame pool. Because when you have that big data set, right, you want to be able to run inference on that big data set. Now, what Chris did was he went and he called out to an existing application, right? He went and he called out to, uh, he was running Llama 3.1 and Mistral on, on an existing application on Fly. Now, what Flame allows you to do now is Livebook can run BeamOps for you. You don't need another application. You don't need to, to go and ask your ops team to spin up a, a model. You don't have to go and start you know, a whole new thing and, and start a new Git repo and, uh, and you know, go and, um, and deploy you know, with, with different settings and all this stuff for your inference. You take that model that you trained before, put it on Tigress, do whatever. You load up the parameters, and you start a flame. You see, this is just max of one, right? Max concurrency, one, right? But what I'm doing is I'm taking a fly machine with four L40s, and I'm, uh, I'm then going to go, and I'm going to create an NX serving, and I'm going to have a def, you know, I've got this module, inference serving. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for figuring this out for me. And uh, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to use Bumblebee, I'm going to load in a model, um, and I'm going to use this partitions true so that this, this one process is going to act like an inference server for my live book. It's going and it's loading the model, it's compiling it, and it's getting ready for inference. This is something that takes hours if you're doing it real quick and you can do it yourself and you know what you're doing. Sometimes it takes days when you have to go and you have to deal with ops teams um, and you have to go and deploy and figure it all out. What we're able to do is we're able to, to take this model and we're able to take a huge distributed data set. We're able to, in our live book, start up a flame and then use place child to take a process and start that process on the flame and we, then we've got an NX serving that's available directly there. So we're going to wait just a second for it to finish doing all of that work and to get ready to take uh, requests for inference. Now, what I want you to remember is that we've currently got a flame running with 32 machines with data frames distributed across all of those machines. And each one of those data frames has you know, 50,000 uh, patents on it. And then we've got a separate serving that we're running. You can spin up a as many flames as you want. We've got a separate flame that's running with, with a serving, uh, with an NX serving on it. Um, and 
just wait a moment and we're going to be able to see them play together and see what they do. So we can see that the model is, uh, is currently um, compiling, which is great. I'm just going to wait for this to finish. Again, we're talking, you know, that says 170 seconds. We're talking three minutes to get to something that would normally take hours or days, require you to spin up, uh, you know, spin up different resources. You know, best case scenario, you can go and you can, you know, spin up a, um, a, a machine on EC2. You can, you know, m hope that you've got the right settings to be able to throw uh, your model up onto it and use it for inference. You can, you know, hope that you're going to be able to, uh, to run, you know, fast API or something really easily so that you can actually run inference against it. Um, and we lost internet connection. <laughs> Well, what you're able to do <laughs> is you're able to take that data frame. You're able to take that, that data frame that was running on another, another fly, uh, so, uh, another flame, and you're able to take the, the uh, data from it. You're able to filter it as if it was local. You're able to pull an abstract, the abstract column from it as if it was local. You're able to then stream from that column as if it was local. You're able to you know, chunk as if it was local, flat map over it with a batch run, which is what we do with NX ser serving, and it's going to send its text from whichever flame it's on to the inference serving that's on its own flame. It's going to then map over, over those. We're going to go and get the labels, and we're going to get back a tensor on our local live book that has our predictions and that we can send off again to any flame that we want to. That's it.